from our studios in Princeton, New Jersey, here's what we're sharing on today's Writers to Writers. We'll offer a clever way to sell your books and take part in a book signing. We'll also take you on location to the New Jersey Romance Writers Conference and meet some of the amazing authors on hand. We'll also share the facts and figures when selling your book to a publishing house. It's all coming up right now. Hello and welcome to Writers to Writers. I'm Keith Fritz. And I'm Jennifer Sneed. And we're going to jump right into our Writers Reveal question of the day. Which is, name a fictional character that you would love to trade places with for a week. Jennifer, let me hear it. So, I would love to trade places for a week with Scarlett O'Hara from oh, Gone with the Wind. very One nice choice. One of my choice. most favorite characters. I think it would be a very intriguing, interesting week. Uh, yeah, I think you just want to wear her dresses. Well, that would be a <laughs> plus, absolutely. Absolutely, I bet. Now, Keith, what about you? Uh, the you character with? name is Jeff Winston. It's kind of an unnamed, unknown name, but he's uh, from the novel Replay by Ken Grimwood. It's time travel. He dies at the age of 43, wakes up at the age of 18, relives his life, dies again, goes oh back my. only he's 18 and a half, and he does it over and over. Oh but my. I definitely need more than one week, that's for sure. Yeah, I think you might. I yeah. think you might. Now it's your turn. Tweet your response to us using the hashtag fictionalcharacterswap or post it on our Facebook page. We also asked a few writers to share their answers, and here's what they had to say. I would switch places with Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman. It's one of my all-time favorite movies, and I would just love the clothes and the wealthy boyfriend and living in the hotel for a week. It would be great. It would be a gal named Claire in a show called Outlander to do um, episode seven over and over again. Yes. If I could switch with any character from one week, it would be Sabrina from Bewitched, and mostly because of the whole no switching and cleaning up thing. It's just awesome. I think I would take Rose from the movie Titanic. She, uh, she went after what she wanted. She grabbed it with both hands for as long as it lasted. The character that I'd like to switch places with for one week would be Hermione Granger from the Harry Potter series. I just, I think she's great. She's got magic and she's beautiful and she's smart and I'd be lucky to be like her. <laughs> One great way to market your book and find new readers is by making public appearances. But if you're not a well-known author, then the invitations from bookstores and libraries probably aren't pouring in. No, they're not. And our next guest is here to talk about a method where you don't have to sit by the phone waiting for it to ring. He has actually started a network of authors who create their own events, and everybody is invited to take part. Here to tell us more is John Gibbs, author and founder of the New Jersey Authors Network. John, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me. All right, tell us, what is the New Jersey Authors Network? It's, it's a way for writers to find other writers who want to get together and put on multi-author multi events at local venues around the Garden State. Uh, they usually take the form of a, a panel Q&A mm -hmm. at a local library, but we do other things too. Now, now who can join this network? Anybody. Uh, we have... Uh, people who are published in the, the big publishers like Macmillan and HarperCollins, etc. Uh, people like myself with small trade press uh, and self-published authors. In fact, even if you're not yet published, you can still join, although we have a rule that you can't be on a panel talking about writing unless you're published in some way. Uh, you get a that seems more. fair. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how does somebody go about becoming a member? And while they're thinking about it, what are the advantages? What are they going to gain from it? Okay, well, uh, you join just, it's free to join, free to use. You just go to the website, which is njauthorsnetwork.com, okay. uh, and there's a link there to a Yahoo group. So you just need a Yahoo ID, which again, they're free. Uh, and basically, once you do that, you're in. Uh, the benefits, I would say, in a nutshell, is you're, you're going to be able to put yourself in front of potential readers. And sometimes that's because you've done a panel Q&A. Uh, as we've grown, uh, we've got over 250 members now, mm. uh, we've started having venues come to us saying, uh, have you got any authors who'd like to take part in a book fair? Or ah, uh, wow. we're a book club, we'd like someone to come and visit. We're doing an author lunch. Would you like someone, to, uh, you know, we'd like someone to... Uh, come and visit and, and we have two systems one one for setting up an event and the other system is for people who've come to us Sounds like you're getting people. some success and a little bit of notoriety already. Well, yeah, hopefully not too much notoriety <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Now libraries and bookstores normally go for well-known authors. What's the advantage in choosing a lesser-known author? From the library's point of view, uh, realistically much as they'd probably love to have JK Rowling come even if she was available 
they probably couldn't afford it. Mm. Uh, they have a very limited budget and, and we are extremely good value because we don't charge. Uh, <laughs> what we say to a library is, hey, if we put on a panel Q&A, uh, let's say we're talking about a, a, a generic subject of writing, a typical panel for us would be, I finished my first draft, now what? Uh, and then we have a, the four or five authors will come along, there'll be a, a set of four or five questions, and then we open it up to the audience. So local writers who may never have seen a panel Q&A, because it's the kind of thing you get at a, a writing conference, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't necessarily get it locally, uh, they get a taste of what it's, what it's like. They get to uh, talk to people who've, who've a little bit, hopefully, further along the uh, publishing ladder that, uh, or further up the publishing ladder than they are. So from a library's point of view, there's an event. I, I think if, if, if we were to ring a library as either a group or one person and say, I'm an author nobody's ever heard of, and I bet you'd love to have me come and Probably they're not that read my book that no one's ever, they're right. not going to be too excited. But if you put on some kind of event, it's like a show, if you like, uh, that, that's something for everybody. And there's a group of people, about. so it's yeah. not just one person, yeah. multiple perspectives. It sounds like a pretty good idea. Yeah, it's, it's worked quite well. So how do you go about choosing who's going to be part of each event? Because you have 250 authors. I'm sure every one of them would like to be a part of each event if they could. Uh, actually, it's realistically, you get a group of 250 people. Imagine a PTA with 250 people. <laughs> you, you are not going to have 250 PTA members champion at the bit to, to get on with the okay. next thing. So there's, there is a, a percentage that will, are interested, and obviously location has a lot to do with it. Okay. But if it's a panel Q&A, uh, so if, say I'm, I've called a local library and I've explained what we're doing, and we'll set a date, we'll set the, the theme, uh, and I'll just post the message on the, on the Yahoo board saying, anyone interested? And generally, it's first come, first served. Uh, if it's the venue contacted us, like, for example, last month, uh, Barnes & Noble in Homedale had a, a Meet the Authors event, mm -hmm. uh, what happens there is I ask who's interested, and the ones who are interested, I'll forward, uh, I call them author one sheets. Uh, people upload a, a one-page PDF to our uh, Yahoo group, and that'll have your author mugshot, your bio, cover picture and a little bit about your books uh, and the venue will look at that the host will look at that and say okay uh, these are the ones we'd like to come and do the event they were the ones that initiated it yeah that sure. makes sense same same as for a book club or the author luncheon or, or what, sure. whatever from there so the yahoo message board seems to be the best way to interact with with the group sure. what are the best ways to take advantage of that yahoo group if i'm right yeah well i would i would say make sure you read the notices uh, because we've got so many members now uh, mm -hmm. well, we, 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 don't, you, don't you, just scroll through you'd Read be surprised it. because with Yahoo you can say I just want a daily digest or something and we all uh, get so many emails yeah, it's very yeah. easy to go oh, here's 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 a here's, a, here's the late, latest uh, bunch of emails from Yahoo and you don't read it um, but I we used to be saying to people it's fine if you want to promote yourself on there but now there's so many members if if we were all posting about the sale on our latest book or our latest blog post or the latest review someone gave, that you'd get lost oh, in all sure, of sure. it. Uh, so be professional with it, you know, be engaged, be friendly, uh, and daft as it sounds, uh, make sure you put your name on any message. It's surprising how many people say, I'd love to do that event. I teach middle oh, school, yeah. I'm not surprised and, by that at all. And, and you know, the username <laughs> might be, I don't know, snowy123 oh. or something. Oh, and so, and yeah. if you know that that's the book somebody right. wrote, that's fine, but, but you don't. But, but yeah, just be professional and, and, and I guess just like in life, isn't it? Okay, sure. so after uh, an event is scheduled and, and the people have been selected, what's expected of them when they actually arrive? Okay. Uh, for a panel Q&A, mm -hmm. um, what I did is I've set up several basic panels. For example, uh, I finished my first draft uh, one I mentioned. So you, you could look up online uh, on the Yahoo group. There's actually uh, files there which tell you the, the title, the blurb, which is what we mm -hmm. send to the libraries, uh, so that they can promote it, and the um, questions that you're going to be asked, because we have four or five standard questions. So I say to people, prepare, because as much as we all think, oh, I'll be fine, like I've come here and I've already mucked up at least once, and I'm sure I'll do again <laughs> in the next couple of minutes, you know, the more you practice, the more relaxed you are. Sure. So that, that that succinct answer uh, actually comes out rather than three minutes of waffle when, because you, you didn't realize you'd be so nervous. Uh, so that makes a big difference. But other than that, obviously turn up, be early, be smartly, or you know, I, I have like, I call it an author outfit because I feel comfortable in it sure. and it's smart, casual, uh, and it works for me. So, uh, but then again, if you're writing about punk rock, you wouldn't necessarily turn up with a safety pin in your nose, but you equally wouldn't probably turn up in a suit. But just, sure. just be confident, be, be comfortable. 
Okay. When you're actually at the event, I, I think uh, sometimes I think it's easy to, it's tempting to say, I'll pitch my book every five seconds because you feel like if you mention your book in every answer, you're talking about writing the first draft. It's really easy to say, when I was writing the first draft of my book, which you can buy on Amazon or whatever, mm -hmm. but I've been to a lot of big writing conferences and I've seen speakers do that and I, I, it's a real turn off. It, yeah. it actually has the opposite effect. I, I mean, think people are more that. interested right. in, in you know, getting engaged with the person. If they like the person, they'll become interested in the books as well. Absolutely. Right. I always tell people, right. it's not about you. You know, if, yeah. if, you, if you can, it, it doesn't sound logical, but, right. but if you forget about your book right. and just focus on giving the them what they want, that some useful information, you get what you want by giving other people exactly. what, what they want. Well, we really appreciate your time. Yeah. We, we Unfortunately, are out of time. Out of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but My thank pleasure. you so much for joining us. Thank so. you very much. Yeah. Look it up. Author, New Jersey Authors Network. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kara McCollum with Writers to Writers here at the New Jersey Romance Writers Conference. I'm here with Susan Mallory, who is the New York Times and USA Today best-selling author. So we're here today uh, for you to tell us how to woo readers with conflict. So con writing conflict is an integral part of any work of fiction, but how does writing conflict for a romance novel differ from other genres? I'm a big believer that people read fiction because of how it makes them feel. If they want information, they'll go read nonfiction. So our, our job as a writer is to take readers on an emotional journey, and part of that emotion is conflict. Now in romance, it's even more important because the whole story, whatever the external plot is, the internal story is about the couple falling in love. And if there's no internal conflict, they meet, they like each other, they date, they end up together, and you don't even have a short story. So conflict is what keeps them from falling in love on page three which is different than what keeps them physically apart for which could be your external plot. So I think conflict is important and conflict needs to grow from who they are. The internal conflict is what the book is going to hang on. For example, if he doesn't trust women, give him a woman he can't trust. If she has trouble trusting a man, the reverse, give her a man she can't right. trust. So that's what you want to look for. I describe it as the the irresistible force and the immovable object. Right. Uh, editors a lot of times will reject a book because they say that an author can't maintain, you know, that sort of intriguing conflict. What is your advice to writers on how to sustain a conflict that's engaging throughout their entire novel? Um, a lot of this can be tied, a lot of times you can tie your conflict to your theme, which is very helpful. The first half of the book you disprove the theme, so if your theme is love heals and the first half it doesn't heal, your conflict shows it doesn't heal. The second half, your theme is proven, you prove love heals, your conflict begins to resolve. So for me, theme and conflict can go hand in hand. It's very helpful to add depth. You work those two together, you do a little bit of planning, you get some structure, even if it's just mental, you don't have to plot. For those of you who are pantsers, don't start sweating. It's okay. You don't have to plot, but you do need to have some direction. So talking about that happy ending, which is why we love romance novels. So what is your advice to, you know, just a, a, a quick tip for writers on how to uh, make a satisfying resolution? One of the things we require of our character in romance is they have to earn their happy ending, and that means they have to overcome their conflict. So in the first half of the book, you want to demonstrate why the conflict is a problem. And the good part is it doesn't even have to be between the hero and heroine. It can be demonstrated with a secondary character because you may not want to pull the trigger on that in the first half. In the second half, you need to show it resolved. And this really does have to be shown. I had a heroine who couldn't trust, and I showed her conflict in a physical way. In the first half of the book, she's swept away on a kayak, and the hero's like, reach out your hand to me, right. and she laughs. She will risk drowning rather than Instead trust him. Trusting. In the second half of the book, and I don't usually do natural disasters, but I happen to in this book, there was a flash flood, and she's literally hanging off the side of a cliff, and it's going to die. He knows she's not going to hold out her hand, and he's like hold out your hand, and she takes right. his hand. So we physically saw, I don't trust, I now trust. Now that's really on the nose, so hopefully you'll all do better than me, but but that's what you want to do. The first half is, you, you need to build to a point. That's why, I, as I said, you've got to have the steps in your head. You've got to see the path of, 
I build the conflict, I resolve the conflict, and it must be resolved in a believable way. We have to have seen the steps the character took in his or her head. I don't believe, I don't believe, okay, maybe, maybe I'm hopeful, I'm willing to take a chance. Right. Resolution. If you want a happy ending that is emotionally satisfying, your characters, they need to do the work. They need to have earned it. We want to, that's why we put them through all the trials we put them through so at the end we can say, wow, he deserves her, she deserves him. We, right. we want to believe they are meant for each other, but they have to earn it. It's not a gift. All right. Well, thank you so much You're for talking welcome. with us, Susan. We appreciate your advice. Thank you. If you've gotten that phone call from your literary agent saying, congratulations, your book has been sold, you know that that's not the end of the story. So today we're talking about what happens next. You're about to enter into a business agreement with a publishing house. So what can you expect from the contract and what's expected of you? Here to share the facts and figures is literary agent Jessica Faust, president of Bookends Literary Agency. Welcome. Hi. Thank thanks. you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So why don't we start out with what information, what type of information is included in a contract? Pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's where it <laughs> Exactly. I mean, the contract is everything from your advance and your due dates to all of the legal nitty gritty of who's responsible for what if you're sued for the book. Mm -hmm. um, how much money are you going to make on the front end? How much money are you going to make on the back end? Uh, who holds what rights to sell foreign rights? Things like that. Um, it's really the responsibilities that the author has to the publisher and the responsibilities that the publisher has to the author. Got it. Okay. okay. I understand that a verbal agreement happens first many times. And, and when that happens, how long before the actual written contract takes place? Yeah, initially, um, the agent and the editor will negotiate um, the basics, the mm -hmm. due dates, the advance, the royalties, and things like that. And that's the verbal agreement. And then the written contract comes roughly. I mean, everything's sort of roughly. Yeah, but of um, four to six weeks, I always okay. tell my authors. And how soon uh, should you expect to hear back from an editor on feedback or requests for revisions? Anything. Uh, anything. 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 Um, what's the, what's the average mean, that, that someone should expect? I mean, ideally, once you turn in your manuscript, ideally you should get re revisions in four to six weeks. But I've had authors wait four to six months. So is it dependent is it that the schedule is very busy and there's just sort of time management issue? It's really, yeah, it really comes down to the, the publishing schedule. Got so. It. The editor will um, place importance on what's going to be published first. So if they have six manuscripts coming in, she will read them in order of the publication right, dates. Okay. Got it. Now, nobody expects to have a perfect piece when it's submitted, so we, we do expect at least one revision. But how many times would you expect an author would actually have to go through that process? Um, really should only have one revision. OK. Um, I mean, I have had you know, authors who get really no revisions from their editors, which I think is personally never a good thing, to oh, yeah. authors who've really just been told, do a revision, the revision goes in, and let's just do a whole new book. Wow. wow. Yeah, yeah, so, but that's really rare. I don't want to panic anybody. Okay. <laughs> that's like, good. Really that's good to know. Thank you. Usually you can expect one revision. One but, solid revision. Yeah. Okay. Now, how long uh, before an author should expect to see their book in a bookstore or online? Ooh, the exciting part. Sadly, a really long time. No. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I, all my examples are coming from the big five. Okay. We, you know, I mean, if you go with smaller publishers, it can change. But um, it's they will schedule the book based on your due date, and they will schedule it a year out. Okay. Typically. Sometimes it can be faster. Sometimes it could be longer, okay. but typically for a year from the point you deliver, you would have a published book in hand. All right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's pretty standard then you know what to expect there. Sure. Right. Okay. Right. So how do royalties work, and is there a difference between print books and e-books? What can an author expect out of that? What's the average? There is. Um, the royalty average, royalty rates are um, typically based on cover price. Okay. So on hardcover, you can expect... Um, now you're challenging me because it's all coming from my head. 10% okay. um, okay. off the cover price on the first 5,000 copies, 12.5% on the next 5,000, 
and 15% thereafter. And we understand that's yeah. not a hard figure. Yeah. That's just so a generic. Right. Right. Sure. right. This is pretty much, these are pretty much industry standard figures. Okay. On trade paperback, it's a straight 7.5%, again, on cover price. All right. Mass market paperback. Now, trade paperback are the larger size paperbacks, more in line with the size of a hardcover. Okay. okay. A mass market paperback are the smaller ones, mysteries, romance, um, science fiction. Those are typically mass market. And the standard royalties for that are 8% to 150,000 copies, and then 10% thereafter. Okay. And ebooks, does that change e-books, the rules? <laughs> yeah, ebooks are typically 25% um, of net. Okay. Which means the amount the publisher receives right. from the retailer. Okay. okay. Now, explain to us, talk to us a little bit about a book advance, the advance. Yes. Um, sure, it, I'm sure an author. Get some money up front. <laughs> can, I, can I get paid for some of my work? <laughs> and what I always like to, to tell the author is this isn't what you're getting paid for the book. You know, we expect to get a lot more than the advance. It's literally just an advance on what we hope you're going to get paid. Okay. Um, so it's a percentage of what the expectation Yeah, is. yeah. The publisher will base it, hopefully, usually on what they think the book will earn out okay. in the first year of sales. Um, and advances for um, a first-time author, debut author in genre fiction, could be romance, mystery, science fiction, paperback genre sure. fiction. Could be anywhere from low, five, ten, twelve and a half mm-hmm. thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay. In that range, mm-hmm. sometimes lower, okay. sometimes higher. Um, and then you hear about these amazing advances well, sure. that some people get. But um, you know, I think a typical advance could be as low as five thousand dollars, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, maybe on the high end for debut authors, but. Somewhere in there, and, and then you get that all at one time, or is it over? You get it. Sadly, no. Oh. <laughs> you get nothing all at one time. Way. <laughs> no, it's divided point. up, and um, you'll get part of it on signing of the contract, um, part of it on the delivery and the acceptance of the manuscript. Which mm-hmm. means it's not just you deliver it; it means they've read they've it, read you've it, done revisions. Like yeah. All of those things, so and it's ready to, to go to weeks, copy. Four to six weeks. Four to six weeks. <laughs> four to six weeks. <laughs> sure. so, yeah. Um, and then a lot of publishers went to the final payment is on publication. Okay. The more money you make in advance, the more payments no, you get. No, what if you don't make money? Does it, do you have to return it? You never have to return the advance. Okay, okay that's no. nice to know. No. And, and the... it can take a long, sometimes you can have a book that two years later finally earns out. Okay, so. all right. So what happens if a book is sold at a discount somewhere? Does that mean the author doesn't get as much money? Does that change? Only if... A uh, contract was made between the publisher and the discounter to s- for the publisher to sell the book to them at discount. Okay. But if the bookstore decides that they're going to run a sale and your book is going to sell for 10% off, 20% off, whatever, no, it should not affect your royalties. Okay. All right. That seems fair. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, just them making a choice to right. run a sale. Um, and then who determines how long a book stays in print for? The reader. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Are you reading the book? <laughs> If not, we're, we're done. Yeah, as long as the book is selling, okay. it'll remain in print. And there is, there should be terms in the contract to specify how much it has to be selling. But typically, as long as the book is being read and bought, well, bought, not just read, I guess, um, then it will remain in print. Okay. One last question, because we're almost out of time. Yeah. How long does the author own the rights? Or when you sell the rights, how long before those rights become maybe the author's again? Can you ever get them you back? You actually only license the rights. I oh. always like to Ooh. correct that. Ooh, You're not good. selling Thank you. them. Yeah. Um, some contracts have terms, so term of copyright or things like that, but typically it is as long as the book is in print. Okay. The publisher will have the rights to continue to publish it, and the author will continue to get paid. Well, okay. again, that seems fair. <laughs> <laughs> so. okay. Thank you so much for coming in. I wish really we had more time. It. Yeah, me so too. This was fun. Jessica, thank you. Thank you. Give your writing the boost it needs by joining one of these genre-specific writing groups in your area. The Garden State Speculative Writers, also known as the GSSW Writers Group, invites writers of horror, suspense, mystery, science fiction, and other genres to join them at one of their meetings or critique groups. 
They meet monthly at the Oldbridge Public Library in Oldbridge. If romance is your writing genre of choice, consider joining the New Jersey Romance Writers. They offer monthly meetings that include hands-on workshops, as well as the opportunity to hear from award-winning authors and from industry professionals. They meet at the Woodbridge Hilton in Island. And if you're interested in writing your own story, meet with others at the Memoir Writing Group in Lawrenceville. They meet weekly on Tuesdays at 2.30 at the Mercer County Library. It's an ongoing program open to new members. You can contact the library for additional details. For more information on these and other writers groups, or to have your writers group listed, go to our website at writerstowriters.com. Thanks so much for spending this time with us. We'll see you next time for more Writers to Writers.